If you all will join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious, loving, giving, and eternal Heavenly Father, we bless you for the many ways you made your presence felt in each of our lives. And just as you made your promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, the promise of land, the promise of seed, the promise of hope, the promise of opportunity, and the promise of celebration, the promise of reunion. And now we think about the promise of restoration. You say you've made that same promise to each of us. We pray for each family represented here. We pray for the members of our family and our class who are away from them, right away from us. And just as you've kept us safe from harm and danger and kept your presence visible in each of our lives, we pray for that same blessing to each of those. We pray for the President of the United States. We pray for each member of Congress. We pray for the members of the ju judiciary and all those in positions of responsibility and authority over us. And just as we ask for the presence of your spirit and your message in our lives. We pray for that same blessing to each of those. Be with us as we continue to study and worship and expand our faith and forgive us our many sins. Uh, as you say, my man. The band leader, you can, you can come forward, please. Can I just hold this thing? Do I have to? Well, I have to turn it on. Okay, how's that? It makes me nervous to have it on my head. It makes me feel like I'm bound up. <laughs> um, this morning, let's talk about exile for a minute. Um, I personally, it, it, something I read this week, maybe it was in the lesson book, that do you understand what it's like to be an exile? I thought about that. And since I live in the same house I've lived in since I was five months old, um, and I've never belonged to another church except this one, um, no, <laughs> I really don't know what it's like to be in exile. Even when I left Davidson, I went to another college or a university. So I've come in. How are you? Good morning. Um, so no, I, I, I don't think I do know what it's like to be in exile, but I want you to think for a minute of these people who are living in Babylon. They are Jews. They are oh, Israelites, to be more technically correct. They have not seen their country. Most of them never saw the country. They were born in Babylon. Remember, the exile lasted from 50 to 70 years, depending on whether you date the end from if you say that the end of the exile was when people started being allowed to go back to Judah, it's 50 years. If you date it to the end where they built, rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, it's 70 years. Either way, the average lifespan in those days was 25 to 30 years of age. So that nobody, you would have to be really, really hale and hearty to have remembered anything about the land of, of Judah. These people have lived in Babylon all their lives. They have, in many cases, prospered. Um, they have been, um, they have lived in a very cosmopolitan city, uh, a sort of a crossroads of the Middle East. They have been exposed to other religions, to lots of foreign gods. Um, they they know Babylon, they, they, but they have been allowed to live in their own community. They have been allowed to maintain their ways of worship. They have developed new ways of worship to accommodate being in exile. And suddenly there comes in their midst this prophet, whomever he or she or it was, this second Isaiah, um, Isaiah of Babylon, who is talking about not only going home, a home they've never seen before, but also talking about suddenly they're going to be like a light to the nations. It's a, I mean, Judea, bless its heart, was really never anything much, but it was a very comfortable little backwater. They were never a big player in the Middle East. In the, in the Fertile Crescent, and they were certainly never a light to the nations, nor did they ever see their God as being a God that they shared with the world. It was their God, a God with whom they were in a special covenant relationship. 
And suddenly, this all new thinking, thinking of God is the God of the whole world and the God of everybody. Think about that. My God is his God too? Goodness. So suddenly, this is what they're being told. Pay attention to me, my people. Oh no, sorry, wrong. I'm sorry. Hence, I will also appoint you as light to the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. How would you react if you heard that? A light to the nations. The Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One, says to one despised and rejected by nations, to the slave of rulers, kings will see and stand up, commanders will bow down. He's talking to Israel. Kings will see you and stand up. Commanders will bow down on account of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Yeah, this is the uh, echo of Sarah's laugh. Oh, when she's told that she's pregnant. Yeah, yeah, because I'm 100 years old. <laughs> where that laugh comes to play, the theological right. laugh, where either you have to be kidding me, or exactly. I, don't know, I don't believe this, or let's move on to something a little bit more credible. That's, I think that would have been the reaction. That would have been the reaction. And remember, not everybody went back. Many people stayed in Babylon. Babylon was comfortable, and especially after Cyrus conquered it, it was much more comfortable because he was a much more benevolent um, ruler than the, than the uh, Babylonians had been, the Persians. But, so yes, it is like Sarah's laugh. You're exactly right. Um, it's ha-ha. What are you talking about? The Lord said, at the right time I answered you. On the day of salvation I helped you. I have guarded you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the land and to reassign, and to reassign deserted properties, saying to the prisoners, come out, and to those in darkness, show themselves. And then sing heavens, he says, rejoice earth, break out mountains with a song. The Lord has comforted his people and taken pity on those who suffer. Isaiah is also a very great poet. The Lord has comforted his people and taken pity on those who suffer. So here they are. They are living in comfort. They are living in a place they know. It's their home. Now, their grandparents, it wasn't their grandparents' home, but it's their home. They're born in Babylon. Almost to the last person, they were born in Babylon. And suddenly they're being told, you can go home. Cyrus instituted, when he conquered um, when he conquered various lands, he did not practice a scorched earth pa uh, policy the way the Babylonians did. And he allowed people to return to their places of origin. And he would allow them to farm and be merchants and prosper. Now, don't think he didn't have a firm control on the situation. Cyrus had the best communication system the world had ever seen. He had mounted, it's kind of a Pony Express kind of thing, but he had mounted messengers who did a constant loop through the empire so that there was mail, and it was communication, and he had an eye on every, and he also had everything divided into provinces. He had governors who were his people um, in the provinces. He knew what was happening in those provinces. But, in but he also was a benevolent ruler. He allowed people to live and make money and prosper. And in return, um, it, was a peaceful, it was a fairly peaceful, it was probably one of the most peaceful times in the history of the Middle East. So Cyrus truly was um, a most unusual uh, ruler and truly deserves the term the great. So he, it's not going to be, but it's not going to be easy to go home either. It was totally destroyed. Remember, Jerusalem, they say, there was hardly stone left standing on stone. Everything is destroyed. And everybody who had any, I mean, I don't know, I used to say anybody who could read, but almost everybody who had any um, abilities had been deported to Babylon so that what were, the people who were left living in the land were extremely poor. 
um, pe peasants just kind of scratching out a living from what's not, I don't know how many of you have been to Israel, I've seen Judah, but it's not the most, it's not the Galilee. It's a pretty, um, it's, it's pretty bleak in some, in some ways. And they're scratching out a living in a place that's nice, not on the sea coast. Um, the main water is the Dead Sea. You can't get much out of that. Um, it's not an easy place to live, particularly if it's been decimated. And suddenly this Isaiah, <laughs> second Isaiah is saying, go home. We're going home. Someday it's going to be all right for us to go home. He sees Cyrus on the horizon. And he, he, it hasn't quite happened yet, but he's, 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 Opening. <laughs> He's predicting that Cyrus is going to come, and when Cyrus comes and conquers Babylon, we will go home. Now, how would you have reacted to that? Oh, I got a good reaction. What's that? I would say to Isaiah, listen, Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> What's in it for you? Oh, good, yeah. What's in it for you? Why are you doing this? Yeah, what's, what's going to happen in the stock portfolio? What's going to happen to the deli down the street, which I frequent often, etc. I got to know what's happening. And what am I going to do when I get there? Uh, well, a lot of people didn't, apparently. But he's taught. But God is talking about a new thing here, and Isaiah is talking. Is talking for God, speaking for God. Go home. Be a light. And in, in addition to that, he's saying you are going to be a light to the world. You are going to be um, uh, held up. You are going to be an example of a holy people. Really. That would be a little uncomfortable, don't you think? Would that be not always thought somewhat in terms of being especially a cho cho chosen? Chosen, but it was a kind of an intimate thing between them and God. They didn't see it personal. They didn't see it as being something that was universal. Of course, um, I don't know that they ever really truly did. It, it, comes to full fruition in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, um, where it really does become a light to the world. But And Christians would read all of this as saying this is a setting, setting up for the, for the coming of the Messiah, and did read it that way in later, day, in later days. But here they're being told, and there is a, a Jeremiah, the Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel proclaims to all the exiles I have carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, cultivate gardens and eat what they produce, get married and have children, then help your sons find wives and daughters and husbands in order that they too may have children because in num to increase in number so that you don't dwindle away. Promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord because your, your future depends on its welfare. That's what they had lived with. Do the best you can in exile. And that has been their, the way, their way of life. You know, promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray for the Lord. Pray for the city. And suddenly, here comes, I, here comes this prophecy saying, uh-uh, you're going home. So we are your in your lesson today. That, that she talks a little about, but we, even though we've never, we may not ever have lived in exile, um, we have just been through an, a, 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 an international trauma. We're still going through a pandemic. Nothing changes society more than pandemics or wars. Um, there are profound social changes resulting from both those things, and we're beginning to see some changes. And right now, none of them look very good, do they? Right now, we're facing, um, there's more, I heard this morning on, the, on, on um, everything I know I, I learned from NPR, I think, um, that 
anti-Asian sentiment in this country is higher than it's ever been, partly because the former president kept referring to this, this disease we're facing as being the Chinese flu, which a lot of people look the wrong way. Um, Anti-Semitism is on the rise. White supremacy is becoming a major factor in this country. Um, nationalism and white supremacy. Th these are problems, particularly in a country that is, prides itself on being diverse and welcoming. This is, this is a major, major problem. We, and of course, we, we're facing a great deal of economic uh, blue black, blow black, blowback, excuse me, not only from the pandemic, but also from the war in the Ukraine, which hasn't helped things any. Um, so we are in a situation of rather serious, in my opinion, a rather serious situation uh, facing this country. And in many ways, it's somewhat similar to the situation that the, uh, the people of the Israelites in Babylon were facing. What do we depend on? What do we trust? What, do, what, in a world that's totally changing, where can we find some stability? And of course, the answer uh, that uh, Isaiah points out, second Isaiah, is that the Lord, your God, provides that stability. And I think we can have, we can draw the same conclusion that Sometimes when there's just a lot of upheaval, you, d you go right back to what your mother told you, which is, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I'm not original in that. Somebody once asked um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was it Bonhoeffer? Karl Barth. Karl Barth, yeah. To, to what was the basis of his religion? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So... Here we are, and here they were 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, faced with tremendous upheaval. Being called, they are being called to go and recreate a nation and recreate a homeland. We are being called to preserve our nation and our homeland. And God is the one doing the calling in both cases. And are we listening? Did they listen? Some of them did. Are we listening? I hope so. Does anybody have any reaction or anything they want to say? If I recall correctly, the early 18th century preachers, Jonathan Edwards being the archetypical preacher back then, they took the Old Testament restoration passages and applied them to, uh, to the young country yeah. that they were developing. And, and, the, and the idea was that we're going to start over for the sake of humanity. We're going to do it right this time. And it's going to be a theocracy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The same way Calvin kind of did that in Geneva. Right. Um, yeah, it's going to be a theocracy. That didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're not here. Uh, the theocracies aren't very much fun to live in, frankly. It comes back to who's in control. Yeah, well, and Jonathan Edwards, remember Jonathan, that famous sermon, is so, so, uh, uh, people in the hands of an angry God. It's a horrible, I mean, he's talking about people dangling over the pit of hell. You know, that's, that's not going to endear you to God. I mean, it's not going to endear God to you if that's the image that's being projected. And that image is always kind of distorted. What uh, Edwards was talking about was that, you know, there are some folks who are not going to foul this up because the good Lord's going to take care of them. And those are the sinners who are going to be dangled and maybe dropped. But the rest of us... will be okay. We have our marching order. We know what to do. If we do it. Ah. Right. If we do it. And it was not a perfect science, obviously. No. And the Juneteenth... You understand how it was. Today we call it the displacement theory. And in reading the lesson, you see those who stayed there in Israel thought others were going to take a place. Coming back. Yeah, it, 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 that's, it, they did. They resented it. I mean, I, 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 
I didn't. I need to read it again to get it. Uh, Sarah's laugh. But we've had this trend in our country for long. I guess humanity had this theory or, or this. We have it today. You know, Part of the, the far right they, is that I will not be replaced, meaning by people of color. That's right. Um, and that was what they were shouting in Charlottesville, by the way. The article in the paper this morning was whether it was the Irish coming to Boston or whether it was the Chinese coming out to the war to build a rail to provide labor, whether it was the Hispanics coming from South and Central, Central America, the United States in the 70s and 80s, right? That, Prosperity for the, those who born for, them, for, for themselves, but, but today as well. So those can't do. Interestingly enough, it was the white people who brought in the slaves. The slave that yes. The the black slaves from Africa. Seventeen thousand ships from shiploads from Africa. Right. Yeah. And, and the Caribbean. In the Caribbean. In the Caribbean. In the Caribbean. So, we have a lot of praying to do. <laughs> We have a lot of work to do, but pandemics can bring about good things as well as bad things. Um, for instance, the rise of the cities in Europe was almost a direct result of the Black Death. Because, and serfs would run away. Town air is free air. And if you could live in a city for a year and a day, you'd be free. That, that, that was the labor crisis. That was the labor crisis, right, yeah. <laughs> and they wanted workers in the city, so serfs were running away from... So, I mean, ch pandemics do create tremendous social change. We're not through this yet. It, it's going to be... It, it's going to be some tough times to get through, I think. But we do have... We do have the example of these people who left behind we'll see this later next week, who left behind a comfortable life in Babylon and went out into the unknown. And for them, it really literally was. I mean, they had legends and they had their, their lore, their folklore and their stories and their religion, but they'd never been, they'd never been out to Judah, Judea. But they step out in faith. They step out in faith, yes. Important part now. And they feel led by God, yes. They do it, or at least some of them do it. The numbers would have discouraged them to step out on faith, make this, embark upon this new horizon. That and think about our, the people who suddenly who went west. Right, right. There is there is something in the human spirit that you always want to know what's over the horizon. North America. Yeah. You know, it's how people. But think about leaving the comfort of Toronto and going to Saskatchewan. Yes. <laughs> I lived there. My parents immigrated. Yeah. Ukrainian and Danish. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it was considered then to be the, the place of opportunity. opportunity. Well, I was. And you embrace that and walk in faith, at least. But I remember from my, you know, ancestors take, passing it down. You did it. You felt like it. You were meant to do it, and you stepped out in faith. And you stepped. And in hard work and yeah. terror, and a lot of climate issues. I mean, cold weather, etc. But, but don't we learn from the New Testament? that you do this and you grow and you, you know, you then pass it on to your family and it's what keeps you going when the going is tough. I always think about my Scots ancestors um, and the Scots-Irish. They came to this country, they come into the port of Philadelphia and then down the mountain road through the Valley of Virginia. They had a wrong rifle in one hand and what did they have in the other hand? Bible. No, a Bible, a Bible, and first they built a house, and then they built a church, and then they built a school. You cleared the woods with you yeah. cleared the woods. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 so, and my parents, uh, my mother's side was Ukrainians. My mother was the first in her family to go to school. 
she was a fourth of seven children, but Canada did not feel they owed an education to anybody who didn't speak English. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But where were you supposed to learn English? Oh, they, they never learned to speak. Oh, they never learned to speak English. Never, yeah. Her uh -huh. parents. And, and then the, the her, earlier uh, generation. And the children yeah. were then only allowed to teach in the Ukrainian area, mm -hmm. Ukrainian mm -hmm. schools, even though know they had educations and everything. They, Canada has, so that, didn't know has that. been pretty prejudiced. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're no different from the rest of us. <laughs> they were surviving. They yeah. were surviving. But I did, I, last summer, I was sitting on a porch in Blowing Rock, looking out over mountains, and I could see why you had this earth, you just had to climb over, you just had to see what was over that mountain. Yeah, over the ridge. Over the ridge. Yes. Now, and I think that's what, that sort of, you know, God's calling them, and you've got to see what's, yeah. what, what is he, what's the plan. So... Now, so we've come to the point where we really are doing a new thing. We're going home. Not only are we going to go home, we're going to be aware that we have a new idea of God. Not that he's just our God, but he's the God of the universe. And we've discovered that we can worship him anywhere. He is everywhere. He is universal. And he's not only my God, but he's your God. You just don't have. You just don't know that yet. But I need to live in such a way that you will see God reflected in the way I live my life, which is still the charge that we have. That let our lives reflect, even in the hard times, and we are in hard times every which way. This is a difficult time right now. To have the hope and you have the grace of God and your life can reflect that grace and that hope. Yes. Mark, I think it's underplayed in verse 23. The identity of God continues to surface that motif throughout all of Scripture. God's point is that I want you to know who I am. And periodically, it comes to the surface, then you realize that I am the Lord. I mean, we hear that in, uh, in Egypt, uh, then we hear that in Christ, in terms of the incarnation. But the whole enterprise of God's action is that I want you to know exactly who I am. Yes. And it says, you will know that I am the Lord, one who hopes in me need not be ashamed. Right. But if you know who I am, I am, then you will come to be able to trust in me. And I think that's true with our politicians. You know, now I don't know who he is or she is, and they're a scoundrel, or they're a rascal, or they have our best interests at heart. But that true identity of who we're following is so essential, or else uh, it's uh, lemmings going off the cliff. Yep. Well, there are a lot of lemmings out there right now. But uh, the Lord does say, know who I am, and do not be ashamed that you're my follower. But it is, it is all right, with respect, to ask questions. And God does, yes, God wants you to ask questions. God, personally, is a very pleasant uh, and suffers me with patience because I want to ask questions. And what's the one question Moses asked? And I, 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 I could rewrite the Old Testament by just that point of who asked the questions, how were they answered, show me what's going on. And I will say to the people that I I don't agree with my political uh, philosophy, but I like to hear what they have to say. Don't you, I, I get into dialogues with God sometimes. Okay. You know, it's like sometimes I question Him. Well, did Moses ask why he's not going to the promised land? Was that the question? No, no, the question was who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And, 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 I, I think that's the underlying issue 
uh, of, of humanity. We want to know who God is. That's, yeah. And we get the fullest expression of that. If I get one day God said, I don't know how else, uh, how else to do this. I will come among you myself and I'll show you who I am. And the disciples wanted to know, you know, who are you? Are they you? didn't come as a mighty conqueror. <laughs> but the, the command is always that, who are you? And, 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 what the, and the answer we get in the Old Testament is that I am who I will become. And then in the New Testament, you know, Jesus says, I'm the light, I'm the life. So if, you, if, so, if, so if you're distracted and going in a different direction, know that you're going to be heading into the opposite of who I am, which is darkness and despair. Well, I'm going to end by, you've heard me read this poem before, but... Uh, you can't stop. Oh. oh, well, I yes, I have to. <laughs> you have to go. But um, this is a poem that um, George the Sixth. this is an excerpt from a speech, the, George, the Christmas speech that George the Sixth made in 1939 um, to the nation when war had just broken out. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness, put your hand into the hand of God. And that should be better to you than light and safer than a known way. Amen. Are, are you on a timeline because of the TV production? No, but y'all got, I mean, no. Why? Do you want to talk so some more about it? We kill time until 11 o'clock service now. Oh, well, I've already worshipped. <laughs> and normally we would too. Yeah. And I would like to say that um, today the. Um, there are two things in the, in the New Testament that I have real trouble with. One is Jesus is this little fit of temper with the olive tree that wasn't blooming when it wasn't the season for olive trees to bloom. And the other is what happened to those poor pigs when he put the, well, today the sermon is the, is the, is the lesson about the pigs. And we started by singing all creatures great and small. <laughs> and I told Peter, I said, that just didn't, it just didn't work. And he said, you know, I tried to play down the pigs. <laughs> And Johnny, I used to tell Johnny Rogers that if he could explain the olive tree to me, I would never question religion again. And he used to send me little notes saying, get me in church on Sunday because I'm going to explain the olive tree, but he never did. <laughs> so we still question, we still have dialogues with God. <laughs> in a way, we could skip church today and just keep on going. This is fascinating what Gus mentioned. <laughs> Uh, uh, I can hardly say the name Jesus Christ myself is so awesome, is so beyond me, I cannot articulate that. But then I think, where would I be 2,000 years ago listening to him? And I think, here he is. Can any good from Nazareth? Yeah, anything good. Well, it did. And then, and A carpenter's son there. from Nazareth? But I fell asleep listening to him. Where am I? Where am I? What am I doing here? I fell asleep. He got irritated with me. He said, Is that the best you can do? Well, show me. Anyway, I'll let, oh, you have to go. I, no, I don't have to go, but Fred, if you had been living in Babylon, <laughs> if you had a prosperous business, a nice house, happy family, and suddenly somebody shows up and says, you've got to go back to this backwater wasteland over here and be a light to the nations. Would you have gone? Well, you have no customers, no clients, no demand for your service. Well, right. I would no. say, well, you're going to have to be a farmer. I would say to find light. You know, what kind of light do you want out of it? A flashlight or a thousand watts? Or nothing. Just keep quiet. You know. Just, just think to yourself. You don't have to answer the question. I'm just giving Fred a hope time. Would I have gone? What would I have done? It comes back to individual. Motive. It also comes back to your motive. age. If you were like about 15, you you would have probably had an itchy foot. You were adventurous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it also comes back to what's in your heart. What's in your heart? 
and, and they had been uh, they had been sent they had been told that this was their promised land this yes, was the right. land that they got the lord their god had given them and that they had a leader that there was cyrus there who allowed it was, yep. free speech yep. and and the thinking process they were not kept under duress I mean, and, paid, really and, and he also them. allowed them to take back the, the, the holy articles that had been stolen right. and he helped pay for the to rebuild the temple right. um yeah. the, the openness of him and some would say generosity but you know and it was the hand of the lord that that orchestrated all of that in my view I mean, he had to see that certain things were in place. Well, and last week, progress. you weren't here last week, but no. um, we talked about the servant in Isaiah. And the servant is seen variously as the prophet or the people of Israel, or Cyrus is actually sometimes seen as the servant. Okay. Yeah, as God's servant. Right. And then finally, the suffering servant is Jesus. Right. And then finally, it's us. <laughs> and after the Second World War, it's interesting, you were Germans. Who look at uh, George Marshall and the Marshall Plan as Cyrus? As, that's right. Oh, and who came because of the way that he restored Germany from rubble. Rubble. Uh, right. And it's just interesting how they tagged that biblically as to what they were going through at that time. Would we have the wisdom to do that again? Because okay. that was one of the smartest things this country ever did. Mm -hmm. Courage yeah. and the courage and Truman took so and I mean yeah. regardless. Yeah, we may be called upon to do that in Ukraine. Uh, uh, well, I think it would be easier because we they are we, they weren't our enemies in the war. I mean, wow. Well, yeah, yeah. That, that was Gus's very common a couple months ago. Just the hand of God. Yeah. Remember that metaphor? Just the hand of God. One of his lessons. Mm -hmm. He used that quite liberally, quite frequently. <coughs> you know, mainly if I'm starting over again, you know what I would do? What would you do? Go straight to Calvary. You what? Go straight to Calvary. Oh, Calvary. Oh, Calvary. 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 oh yes. Have you ever seen Look what it did for Sharon. It was the winners. It was the winners. <laughs> it was, uh, it was oh, a it was ski the girl. Game. That's yeah, ski queen. Yeah. I can see her coming off that high jump. <laughs> that little... Ski Queen, oh, oh. you share the wrong vision. <laughs> Calgary, take me.